Hello, my name is Grant Kramer, and I'm a professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. And today, I will give you a rather academic lecture on fermentation by yeast. First of all, what do wine, beer, and bread have in common? They are commonly made by fermentation, by yeast, in particular, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. What do yeast look like? They are one-celled single organisms. Each cell is round to ovoid in shape and approximately five to 10 micrometers in diameter, or about five to 10 times bigger than most bacteria and about 10 times smaller than many human cells. Where do yeast live? They're commonly found on fruits and flowers, but we really do not know all the places where yeast may live. Yeast grow by budding off small daughter cells from a large mature cell. Buds grow larger as the DNA is replicated inside the cell. Large daughter cells separate from the mother cell. The yeast cell cycle takes approximately 100 minutes under optimal conditions, 30 to 35 degrees centigrade. And they die after about 26 cycles, upon which they sink to the bottom of your wine tank, making or forming lees. Growth rates are logarithmic, but vary enormously depending on the yeast strain and the environment. The most well-known and commercially significant yeasts are the related species and strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Saccharomyces is a Latinized Greek meaning sugar fungus, while cerevisiae means of beer. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is one kind of yeast. Yeasts are one kind of fungi, including mushrooms and mold. Yeast cells digest sugars such as sucrose, which is found in beet or cane sugar, fructose and glucose, which is found in honey, molasses, maple syrup, and in fruit, particularly grapevines or grapes, um, maltose, which is derived from starch in flour, and triolose, which is found in rye. The sugar digestion process by yeast is fermentation, which makes carbon dioxide and ethanol that are released into the surrounding liquid. What are the nutrient requirements for yeast? Important for them is the source of carbon or energy. So all strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae can grow aerobically with oxygen on glucose, maltose, and triolose. Growth on other sugars is variable, but sucrose, galactose, and fructose are generally well-fermented sugars. Yeast fail to grow on lactose, cellobios, and pentose sugars, five-carbon sugars, such as arabinose. Yeast require nitrogen. All S. cerevisiae strains can use ammonium ions and urea as the sole source of nitrogen. They cannot use nitrates since they lack the ability to reduce them to ammonium ions. They can also use most amino acids, very small peptides, and nitrogen bases as nitrogen sources. The amino acids histidine, glycine, and lysine are not used as nitrogen sources. S. cerevisiae does not excrete proteases, so extracellular protein cannot be metabolized to produce amino acids for utilization. Other major nutrients include phosphorus, which is required and can be assimilated as a dihydrogen phosphate ion, sulfur, which is required and can be assimilated as a sulfate ion or as organic sulfur compounds, for example, the amino acids methionine and cysteine, they need metal ions such as magnesium, iron, calcium, and zinc, which are required for good growth of yeast cells. And they need vitamins. In general, S. cerevisiae is mostly self-sufficient for vitamins. However, most strains require biotin, which is vitamin B7, and pantothenate, which is vitamin B5, in order to get full growth. As I mentioned, fermentation is a conversion of sugars to acids and gases or alcohol. 
Fermentation is common in yeast and bacteria. Yeast fermentation begins with glycolysis. Glycolysis produces substrate level phosphorylation for energy of the cell. The particular important compounds are ATP and NADH. Glycolysis is the first step common to many fermentation pathways. So we have a hexose such as glucose plus two NAD plus plus two ADP plus two HPO4s getting converted to two pyruvates, two NADHs, energy rich, two energy rich ATPs, two waters, and two hydrogens. So basically, one glucose produces two pyruvates plus two NADHs and two ATPs. Subsequent steps depend upon the presence of an electron transport acceptor molecule, such as oxygen. And this is a process known as oxidative phosphorylation, which produces large amounts of ATP via an electrochemical proton gradient generated across the mitochondrial inner membrane via the electron transport chain. Oxidative phosphorylation generates much more ATP than glycolysis alone. For that reason, cells generally benefit from avoiding fermentation when oxygen is available. They want more energy. However, fermentation takes place in the absence of oxygen when the electron transport chain is unusable. Without oxygen, fermentation becomes the primary means of producing ATP, the important energy source for the cell. The second step in fermentation is to regenerate the NAD plus from the NADH made during glycolysis. This is a critical step or fermentation cannot proceed. Fermentation turns NADH and pyruvate produced in glycolysis into NAD plus and an organic molecule, which varies depending on the type of fermentation. In ethanol fermentation, fermentation produces ethanol and carbon dioxide from pyruvate. So glucose utilizes two ADBs and two NAD pluses to make two ATP to two NADH in glycolysis to make two pyruvates. Those two pyruvates then are converted into CO2 and ethanol via acid aldehyde in this case. A different form of fermentation that you're familiar with is lactic acid fermentation, which produces lactic acid from pyruvate. Lactic acid is not a gas or does not make a gas. It occurs in our muscles when they use energy faster than the blood can supply oxygen. Also, it occurs in some kinds of fungi and bacteria. So let's recap the role of yeast in fermentation. The primary role of yeast is to convert sugars into ethanol. Glucose metabolism by yeast in the presence of oxygen produces large amounts of energy and many different intermediates that the cell needs to grow. In the absence of oxygen, fermentation, the cell will produce ethanol as a waste product. Eventually, all the fermentable sugars will be metabolized, leaving only a negligible amount of residual, unfermentable pentose sugars. Products other than alcohol that yeast produce can influence the resulting wine. These include glycerol, which adds body or reputed body to the wine and a slight sweet taste. Methanol, although more commonly found in red wines than white, it's only found in very small amounts that are not harmful to us. These produce fusel alcohols formed by the decomposition of amino acids and sugars by yeast. They contribute both positive and negative aromas, including isyl amyl alcohol, which contributes to banana aroma, which is isoamyl acetate. Yeast produce succinic acid, a minor acid in wine. Yeast produce acetic acid, considered a main component of volatile acidity and can make a wine taste unbalanced and overly acidic. Acetic acids also produced by a contaminating bacteria called acetobacter. During fermentation, acetaldehyde is also produced, a volatile compound. Most acetaldehyde is reduced to ethanol or is bound by sulfur dioxide, but concentrations between 50 and 100 milligrams per liter can remain in wine. They can contribute 
fruity aroma at low concentration, but smell like rotten apples in high concentrations. Hydrogen sulfide also is produced, which can react with ethanol to form ethyl mercaptans and disulfides that contribute to off aromas and wine falls. Pyruvic acid can be produced, which can react with anthocyanins extracted from the grape skins to create a more stable color pigment that can enhance the color of some red wines. These are known as piranoanthocyanins. And finally, and perhaps most important to me, are the volatile esters that yeast produce. Fruity aromas come from es the esters produced. Ester production is dependent upon temperature. The cooler, the better. The cooler temperatures allow more absorption of the gas in the wine, and the high CO2 concentrations that can be produced can also blow off these esters from the wine. Esters are in very low concentration, and just a slight difference can make a big impact on the wine. Ester formation is also influenced by the amino nitrogen content of the juice and the yeast strain. Different yeasts produce different volatile profiles, including volatile esters. Nitrogen deficiency can inhibit the ester production as well. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel where we will have subsequent videos regarding the cultivated and wild yeast and how they impact our fermentations.